Good morning, I'm Pastor Gillespie from St. John Evangelical Lutheran Church and School, Sherman Center, Random Lake, Wisconsin. Good to have you with us here on February 7th, uh, 27th, 2021 for the Congregation at Prayer, a guide for daily meditation and prayer. As we do on Saturdays, uh, we look at tom- two readings for tomorrow. Sometimes they are uh, the Epistle and Old Testament that we'll be using, or sometimes they're the alternate readings, um, but they can also bring out some more nuance to the day and help you in your meditation upon God's Word tomorrow in the divine service. Um, I also like to look, if possible, at the uh, psalm a little bit as well that we've been praying. So we'll do that today. All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Say our memory verse. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. John 6, verse 51. Our psalm, Psalm 107, beginning in verse 33. He turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water, and there he lets the hungry dwell, and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing they multiply greatly, and he does not let their livestock diminish. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, evil, and sorrow, He pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless ways. But he raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad, and all wickedness shuts its mouth. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. So we've been praying this psalm, and this is now the third part, um, so for the last three weeks, uh, and we haven't actually thought about the whole thing as a summary, so I'm going to do that now. This is using an excellent uh, work from Father Patrick Henry Reardon called Christ in the Psalms, a lovely book. And uh, as we heard in the Congregation Assembly last Sunday, uh, many of our congregation members appreciate a perhaps renewed emphasis on praying and singing the Psalms. Uh, And this would be a great text to go alongside that. So I'm going to read to you what he has to say about this Psalm, now that we've finished it. The outline of this Psalm is given early. From the regions he gathered them, from east and west, from north and from the sea. The four corners of the earth, expressed in the ancient Greek text in this unusual way, indicates the fourfold progression in the poetic narrative of redemption. Four times we read, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Right, so that's four times in there. This is a, a historic meditation for attaining contemplative wisdom. Its final line asks, quote, Who is wise and will guard these things and will understand the mercies of the Lord? Right, so you see that as verse 43 here, although he's translating from the Greek, not from the Hebrew. The four distresses in this psalms in this psalm are the wandering in the desert, a situation of imprisonment or bondage, a sickness, and a storm at sea. The last of these, the storm at sea, explains why in the four directions listed in the beginning of the psalm we read of sea instead of the expected of the south. Nice nice point. Just as the people are delivered four times, so they are four times summoned to the praise of God. Let them confess the Lord for his mercies and his wonders to the sons of men. These four distresses may be understood literally or by way of metaphor, 
or as a combination of these. Thus, for instance, when our psalm speaks of suffering in a waterless, trackless wasteland, uh, which was uh, right here in verse 4, right? 40, I should say. Uh, This may be understood as referring to the return from the Babylonian exile, as well as to the earlier wandering of the Exodus generation. It may also include any experience of being lost and trying to find one's way back home. Thus, it may describe the journey of a reckless son lost in a distant country and already given up for dead. Luke 15, the parable of the lost son. This son, in turn, may be Jacob exiled in Haran, where the drought consumed him by day and the frost by night and sleep departed from his eyes. Genesis 31. And it may likewise be any or all sinners exiled from the garden and wandering away from the face of God, quote, without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Ephesians 2, verse 12. Similarly, the psalm's next part, dealing with bondage or imprisonment, may refer to Joseph sold into slavery, fettered in a foreign land and presumed already to have perished, Genesis 37. Or it may be descriptive of Micaiah in 1 Kings 22, or Jeremiah in chapter 37 to 39, or John the Baptist, Matthew 11, or the Apostle Paul, Acts 23 to 26. Right? Lots of examples of people being put into prison. And it may refer to our own spiritual captivity, of which Jesus said that he has come to set the oppressed at liberty. Luke 4. Then there is the section of the psalm describing conditions of sickness, which is potentially manifold in its applications. This could be the prayer during the deathly illness of King Hezekiah, for instance, or the affliction of the paralytics at Capernaum, Mark 2, or at Bethesda, John 5, or the woman with chronic bleeding, which we talked about yesterday, Mark 5, uh, or the lame man at the gate called Beautiful, Acts 3. To Jesus, after all, they brought, quote, all sick people who were afflicted, with various diseases and torments, those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. Matthew 4. And the Lord's healing especially concerns the forgiveness of sins. Mark 2, John 5. This part of the psalm, then, is also a metaphor for our own various illnesses, whether of body, mind, or heart. And then the fourth torment. Likewise, when our psalm speaks of enduring a storm at sea, it may refer to the storm suffered by the shipmates of Jonah, which I think we talked about, Uh, last week, or by St. Paul, also tormented at sea, or by the disciples on the lake of Gennesaret. I think we talked about that too. While Jesus yet slept in the stern of the boat. The fierce storm of this story may also indicate all of us as, quote, children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Ephesians 4.14. Many and diverse are the world's storms and hurricanes. Our psalm is addressed to, quote, those redeemed by the Lord. Its historic meditation, that is to say, is directed to those who stand already within that history and the beneficiaries of its blessing. This is the church, right? So all four torments represent the afflictions of the church that made up by those whom he has redeemed out of the hand of the enemy, those whom he has gathered from the four regions of the earth. So this psalm summons such as we meditate on what the Lord has done in our midst and on our behalf, quote, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God, 1 Corinthians 2. This psalm is a call to that profound effort of reflection and praise, right? To consider the manifold ways that God has delivered us and here likened to four different torments. Again, uh, just to go back to the beginning, the wandering in the desert, a situation of imprisonment or bondage, a sickness, and a storm at sea. So it might be worth your effort to go back and look at the entire psalm now that we've prayed it in three parts. Huh? All right. Old Testament reading for tomorrow is from Genesis 32. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. (laughs) So he said, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, 
Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. Then he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, quote, For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, and the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. All right. Um, I think it's fitting for us to consider uh, what Dr. Luther has to say on this text from um, his magnificent commentary on Genesis. All right, so let me get to it here. Oh, I'm not quite to the right page. Hold on. Genesis 32, right? 32 verse what? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, there it is. Uh, 36. No, 32. Oh, no, I scrolled too far. Sorry. Hold on a second. 32 verse 22. There we go. All right. Uh, let's see. We're talk- we'll skip over the, the normal, just uh, exegetical work that he does here. Um, but understand what's going on, rather. We see, moreover, with what great care Moses, or rather the Holy Spirit, describes even the most trifling actions and passions of the patriarchs, among which none of the showy and prodigious works such as the monks and the self-righteous boast of are, em- are prominent. But these passions are especially outstanding and golden because they have this promise, that not only their death and blood are precious in the sight of the Lord, but that even the hairs of their head are precious and numbered. Therefore, the Holy Spirit did not seem it unworthy to linger over these domestic and pastoral works and passions. Right, And here he's talking about sending him over uh, the river with all that he had. For faith is exercised very well in these matters, and there ensures a sacrifice well-pleasing to God. And then he goes on about monks, of course, because he likes to do that. All right. Now, regarding this wrestling um, until the break of day, this is what Luther says. This passage is regarded by all as among the most obscure passages of the whole Old Testament. Nor is this strange, because it deals with, with that sublime temptation in which the patriarch Jacob had to fight not with flesh and blood, or with the devil, but against God himself. But that is a horrible battle when God himself fights and in a hostile fashion opposes his opponent as though on the point of taking away life. He who wishes to stand and conquer in this struggle must certainly be a holy man and a true Christian. Accordingly, this story is obscure because of the magnitude of its subject matter and because of its obscurity. All the other interpreters pass it by. They just skip over it. It would be also permissible for us to pass it by, but we shall stay, still say what we can. Um, let's see, what should I read? He gives all sorts of interpretations here. Uh, yeah, here's what I want to read. All right. Wherever, therefore, the name of the, oh, no, let's go back. Um, so also in chapter 28, verse 12 and 13, when Jacob sees the angels ascending and descending and the Lord stands on the ladder, here we must understand that the Lord the Lord, not as an angel, as those who ascend and descend are called angels by names, but as the Son of God, who was to become incarnate, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is true God and true man. Right? So Luther is saying that the angel that he wrestles with is not just any angel, but it is the angel of God, that is the Son of God. By the communication of properties, we say, man is on high above all creatures, and God is the lowliest one. This is the mystery quote, into which the angels long to look, 1 Peter 1, 12, because on account of the unity of person, they see God below, but the man above. So also we say man sits at the right hand of God the Father. Likewise, God descends into hell and ascends into heaven. This is the communication of properties concerning which we spoke more copiously above. It's also in our Lutheran confessions at length. Wherever, therefore, the name of the angel is not expressed, we do not understand it as angels, in this passage, it is expressly stated, quote, you have prevailed with God. Not only, quote, you have striven with God, but, quote, you have also conquered. Likewise, the statement follows later, quote, I have seen God face to face. But the passage in Hosea we interpret to mean, 
that these words which the prophet relates are imitative. Not that we may explain his own doctrine and viewpoint concerning this example, but that he may reprove and reproach the false prophets who made a boast of such words and stubbornly tried to defend their idolatry against the temple of Jerusalem and the divine regulation of worship under the pretext, an example of this patriarch Jacob. Luther, very flowery with words. There's no need, they used to say, for us to make offerings at Jerusalem, etc., etc., right? But I wanted you to, to catch, we don't have to talk about the false prophets, how uh, we rightly understand that Jacob wrestles not with just any angel, um, but with God himself. And Luther rightly points out that this is a dangerous wrestling. <laughs> um, one needs to be confident in one standing before God um, to do this. So here we go. But our opinion is this, that the wrestler is the Lord of glory, God himself or God's son, who has become, was to become incarnate and who appeared and spoke to our fathers. For God, in his boundless goodness, dealt very familiarly with his chosen patriarch Jacob and disciplined him as though playing with him in a kindly manner. But this playing means infinite grief and the greatest anguish of heart. Right? So for Jacob, um, it's, it's, it's terrible. Uh, but for God, it's just playful. I love this. Right? It's like, um, oh, that scene with, uh, in uh, Chronicles of Narnia with uh, Aslan and Lucy. And Aslan is, is, um, seems to be tormenting her, but rather he's just playing with her. Or um, I think it's in the last book where he's, um, uh, where he's got uh, Trumpkin, the dwarf, and he's, he's just kind of bouncing him back and forth between his paws, and the dwarf is just terrified because it's a lion, and yet it's the Lord, and he's just having a good time with you. <laughs> Uh, so C.S. Lewis definitely picked up on this. Uh, but this playing means infinite grief and the greatest anguish of heart. In reality, however, it is a game, and the outcome shows when Jacob comes to Peniel. Then it will be manifest that they were pure signs of most familiar love. So in the moment, it's torment, but in the end, it's love. So God plays with him to discipline and strengthen his faith, just as a godly parent takes from his son an apple, uh, with which the boy was delighted. Not that he should flee from his father or turn away from him, but that he should rather be incited to embrace his father all the more and beseech him, saying, Father, give me back what was taken away. Then the father is delighted with the test, and the son, when he recovers the apple, loves his father more ardently on seeing that the love, that such love and child's play gives pleasure to the father. These games are very common on the domestic scene, but in the affairs and contests of the saints, they are also very serious and difficult. For Jacob has no idea with whom it is he is, who is wrestling with him, he does not know that it is God, but he later asks what his name is. But after he receives the blessing, he says, I have seen the Lord face to face. Then new joy and life arises from the sad temptation and death itself. This, therefore, seems to be the teaching of this story. If only I could expound it according to its worth, that according to the example of Jacob, God at times is accustomed to play with his saints, and as far as he himself is concerned, with quite childish, childish playing. But to us, whom he tempts in this way, it appears far different. However, it is excellent and very salutary exercise and perfect instruction. And this is blessed, or blessed with a very happy end, namely, that one learns, quote, what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God, Romans 12. To the flesh it cannot seem otherwise than an evil, troublesome, and gloomy will. But when we are weeping, God is smiling in the most kindly manner, and he takes pleasure in those who fear him and hope in his mercy. Uh, he keeps going. This is a, a great section. I, I started a little too early. Now I've gotten into the section I wanted to read. So um, That's from Luther's Genesis Lectures, uh, Volume 6 of Luther's Works, which are over at church, so you can check that out if you like. Uh, page, I don't have the page, but it's on Genesis 32, verse 24. All right, very good. And then the epistle is from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. Now, on the epistle, um, I'd like to demonstrate how it is applied in the context of our Lutheran confessions. And this is from the uh, article, article 20 
of uh, the Augsburg Confession on good works, which is a topic that we often struggle uh, to confess, but here I think it's confessed well uh, by Melanchthon, Philip. Again, Article 20 of the Augsburg Confession on good works. All right, and specifically it's going to use, hold on, uh, which, te- which part of Rome? Romans 5 verse 1, all right, is going to be used here. So, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, let's see where we are. First, they teach that, that our works, that is, they, Rome, teach that our works cannot reconcile God to us or merit forgiveness. Or, uh, that's not right. We teach. Yes, our teachers teach um, that works cannot reconcile God to us or merit forgiveness of sins, grace, and justification. Right? So works have nothing to do with our standing before God. We obtain reconciliation only by faith when we believe that we are received into favor for Christ's sake. He alone has been set forth as the mediator and atoning sacrifice. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. In order that the Father may be reconciled uh, through him. Therefore, Whoever believes that he merits grace by works despises the merit and grace of Christ. In so doing, he is seeking a way to God without Christ by human strength, although Christ himself said, quote, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, verse 6. This doctrine about faith is presented everywhere by Paul. Quote, by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Ephesians 2, verse 8 is the gift of God. Now, if anyone wants to be tricky and say that we have invented a new interpretation of Paul, and by the way, there's still people saying that today. It's actually called the new uh, perspective on Paul, saying that the Reformation Church got it wrong. Um, This entire matter is supported by the testimony of the Church Fathers. Augustine defends grace and righteousness of faith in many volumes against the merits of works. Ambrose, in his book, The Calling of the Gentiles and elsewhere, teaches the same thing. In that work, The Calling of the Gentiles, this is what he says. Quote, Redemption by Christ's blood would be worth very little, and God's mercy would not surpass man's works if justification, which is accomplished through grace, were due to prior merits, that is, our merits. So justification would not be a free gift from a donor, but rather a reward due to the laborer. Spiritually inexperienced people despise this teaching, that is, the teaching that we are justified freely by grace as a gift from God, not by our own works. However, God-fearing and anxious consciences find by experience that it brings the greatest consolation, that we're saved not by works, but by faith. And faith not even being a work, that's being a gift of God too. Consciences cannot be set at rest through any works. Consciences cannot be set at rest by any works, but only by faith when they take the sure ground that for Christ's sake they have a gracious God. Consciences are only set free by the forgiveness of sins received freely as a gift. That's me. As St. Paul teaches, here's Romans 5, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. The whole doctrine must be related to the conflict of the terrified conscience. It cannot be understood apart from this, that conflict. All right, so we cannot talk about works without talking about the conscience and the way that works actually terrify the conscience. Therefore, inexperienced and irreverent people have poor judgment in this matter because they dream that Christian righteousness is nothing but civil and philosophical righteousness, right? So doing the right thing before your neighbor or having the right thoughts rather than being reconciled to God freely through Christ. Until now, consciences were plagued with the doctrine of works. They did not hear consolation from the gospel. Some people were driven by conscience into the desert and into monasteries, hoping to merit grace by a monastic life. Some people came up with other works to merit grace and make satisfaction for sins. This is why the need was so great for teaching and renewing the doctrine of faith in Christ, so that anxious consciences would not be without consolation, but would know that grace, forgiveness of sins, and justification are received by faith in Christ, not by your own works. People, and here's the point I was trying to make earlier, people are also warned that the term faith does not simply mean a knowledge of of a history, such as the ungodly and devil have. Rather, it means a faith that believes, not merely in history, or the history, but also the effect of the history. In other words, it believes this article, the forgiveness of sins. We have grace, righteousness, and forgiveness of sins through Christ. The person who knows that he has a Father who is gracious to him through Christ truly knows God. He also knows that God cares for him, and he calls upon God. In a word, he is not without God, as are the heathen. 
For the devils and ungodly are not able to believe this article, the forgiveness of sins. Hence, they hate God as an enemy and do not call him and expect no good from him. Augustine also warns his readers about the word faith and teaches that the term is used in in the scriptures not for the knowledge that is in the ungodly, but for the confidence that consoles and encourages the terrified mind. Furthermore, we teach that it is necessary to do good works. This does not mean that we merit grace by doing good works, but because it is God's will. It is, it is only by faith and nothing else that forgiveness of sins is apprehended. The Holy Spirit is received through faith, hearts are renewed, and given new affections, and then they are able to bring forth good works. Right? But it's a gift of the Spirit through faith. Ambrose says, faith is the mother of a good will and doing what is right. Without the Holy Spirit, people are full of ungodly desires. They are too weak to do good works that are good in God's sight. Besides, they are, in, they are in the power of the devil who pushes human beings into various sins, ungodly opinions, and open crimes. We see this in the philosophers who, although they tried to live in an honest life, could not succeed. But they were defiled with many open crimes, such as human weakness, without faith and without the Holy Spirit, when governed only by human strength. All right, and he keeps going on good works. Right? But note, what is most important there, we are justified by faith, we have peace with God, right? and this is for the sake of conscience. Right? And our conscience is afflicted by the way that we sin, that is, that we violate our conscience by our thoughts, words, and deeds. Right? And so we have this standing before God that we know we are guilty, we are ashamed. Right? And that's why having the forgiveness of sins declared upon us, really, for Christ's sake, um, is such a wonderful consolation that brings and consoles and encourages the terrified mind, as Augustine said there. All right. Let's confess the sacrament of the altar. What is the benefit of this eating and drinking? These words, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, show us that in the sacrament, forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation are given us through these words. For where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. How can bodily eating and drinking do such great things? Certainly not just eating and drinking do these things, but the words written here, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, these words, along with the bodily eating, are the main thing in the sacrament. Whoever believes these words has exactly what they say, forgiveness of sins. All right, so you see uh, the application here to the sacrament of the altar. It's Jesus' words that give the consolation to the conscience. He says, your sins are forgiven in, with, and under the bread and wine that is his body and blood in the sacrament. That's what gives the benefit, is the words that Jesus speaks. Where he gives forgiveness of sins, there we're confident, right? Because it's the forgiveness of sins that he purchased and won for us at the cross. All right. Let us pray. We pray for faithfulness to the end, for the renewal of those who are withering in the faith or have fallen away, for all pastors as they prepare to administer Christ's holy gifts, and for receptive hearts and minds on the Lord's day. On this day, we pray in Thanksgiving with Mitchell, who celebrates his birthday, with, or for rather, Marcella, Kelsey, Amanda, John, Timothy, Sandy, Linda, Ken, Aaron, and Penny, who are in need of the gifts of the Lord in regards to healing. Pray the Lord be with our homebound, Bev, David, Willis, and Janice, and Mickey, and that he give great success to the missions and mercy work of the church, especially Sheboygan Lutheran High School and Sheboygan County Hispanic Outreach. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Pray the collect for this week. O Lord God, you led your ancient people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide the people of your church that following our Savior, we may walk through the wilderness of this world toward the glory of the world to come. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right. Do we have a commemoration this day? I cannot remember. So let me check. Don't think so. Okay. Let's continue with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil. 
that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. All right. Uh, rather than sing, let's actually speak. Uh, we'll speak the hymn today as poetry. We'll do stanzas one, two, and four. All mankind fell in Adam's fall. One common sin infects us all. From one to all the curse descends, and over all God's wrath impends. Through all our powers corruption creeps, and us in dreadful bondage keeps. In guilt we draw our infant breath, and reap its fruits of woe and death. From hearts depraved to evil prone flow thoughts and deeds of sin alone. God's image lost, the darkened soul, seeks not nor finds its heavenly goal. But Christ, the second Adam, came to bear our sin and woe and shame, to be our life, our light, our way, our only hope, our only stay. All right, many blessings today uh, on your day. I encourage you to join us tomorrow uh, in person for divine service here at St. John, 9.30 a.m., as we'll consider the readings you heard, but especially the gospel reading for tomorrow. Um, And uh, if you can't join us in person, of course, you can watch the stream live online uh, on all the various channels that were available. So again, blessings on your day. We'll see you tomorrow.